Um, so I want to welcome everybody to our Lunch and Learn today. The Attachment Network of Manitoba has been doing these virtual Lunch and Learns through. We started midway through the pandemic, and I think we're probably going to keep it up. It's a little warmer in the wintertime, certainly, to be sitting at, um, at home or at our own desks and, um, and uh, joining in instead of driving across town. So I want to thank everybody for having lunch with us today. Um, I'm Joanne Brown. I'm the co-chair of our Attachment Network in Manitoba. And um, as I said, I'm recording today's session. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, announcements here, starting with a land acknowledgement that I want to acknowledge that we're located on Treaty 1 territory and that we gather in the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota, the Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, as I said, we've been doing these lunch and learns uh, for a little bit now, and, and I'm so grateful that, uh, that folks have um, agreed that we've been able to twist arms so um, to get people to present. There's so much rich uh, knowledge in our community, and we're always excited to be able to, to share our little hidden gems with everyone. Um, we're not going to have a lunch and learn in December. It's often a little bit of a crazy month for people, um, but we will resume if you want to write it in your calendar, January 19th. We're going to have American educator and author Michael McKnight. He's going to talk about trauma-informed schools. <clears throat> That's getting a lot of traction these days. And I'd encourage you um, to look up his books. Um, Michael McKnight is from New Jersey. Um, and then on February 16th, we're having a psychologist from Brandon, Dr. Amy Wendell, will be talking with us about postpartum implications for attachments. So uh, another... Uh, topic that sort of transcends a lot of the work that, that many of us do in this field. But today I'm really excited that we have a friend of mine and, and a lovely uh, person who's going to be very knowledgeable to talk to us about impacts of immigration and resettlement on attachments. So I want to introduce you to Heather Robertson, who is currently the uh, Director of Mental Health Services at Aurora Family Therapy, which is housed at the UW. And um, Heather has lots of experience, both as a former social worker, current master of marriage and family therapist, and um, um, had 15 years in the settlement sector where she provided, pretty much did everything, um, provided a lot of clinical support program, development, advocacy, you name it, um, to folks in that sector, and uh, currently oversees the delivery of clinical services to both individuals, couples, families, in Manitoba through Aurora and a small private practice because, you know, what do you do in your spare time, right? And, uh, <laughs> um, and of course, you as well have, you know, strong roots in attachment and, and understanding trauma and how that affects the populations that you serve. So, Heather, I'm so glad that you're with us today and welcome. And I'm going to get really quiet and just keep letting people in here and, and I'll let you take over. And you can just let me know because we found that, um, we do not have a um, a co-facilitator feature on our Zoom any longer, so I'm going to be putting up Heather's PowerPoint and doing everything she tells me to do. Mm. How's that? You're a, you're a very powerful person today. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm I'm excited to be here today to to be talking about this. Um, as Joanne mentioned, uh, I was a social worker for many, many years, and I have been working in the settlement sector for quite a long time. Uh, and most of that work has been uh, done with children, youth and families. Um, went back to school and became a marriage and family therapist and was really fortunate uh, to get to do one of my supervised clinical practicums at New Directions uh, and was really introduced, I think just immersed fully into kind of the attachment framework. Um, and it just, I think married so well with what uh, the current work I was doing, uh, some of the issues that I, I saw, you know, working with children, youth and families. And I, I always joke that I, I drank the Kool-Aid and uh, never looked back um, and incorporated it into um, a lot of the work that I do now as a therapist. Uh, if you want to pull up, Joanne, the um, PowerPoint and we can start going through it. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the impact uh, of immigration and settlement um, 
on attachment, I'm really going to be focusing on uh, looking at uh, people who are arriving in Canada from a refugee background. That being said, um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is going to be relevant um, to people who have experienced immigration and uh, resettlement. Um, okay, are we good to good to go here, Joanne? All right. So we're going to start off the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about just a very brief snapshot of the current kind of um, immigration and settlement reality in Canada. So you have a little bit of background on, um, you know, the numbers that we see and and where people are settling. Just as a brief introduction, um, I think we all know. Uh, you know, for working from an attachment perspective that as humans we're wired for connection and really our, our overall well-being and survival, it depends on our ability to create and maintain relationships with others. Uh, as a species, like we greatly, greatly suffer when these connections are threatened and severed. Um, there's lots of different life experiences that can create disruptions uh, in connections and create significant challenges. And so today we're really gonna be talking about how people's experience with war and conflict and forced migration and then the whole resettlement process um, really acts as one of those disruptions. Next slide. For some reason, this is a complication I run into with Zoom, that if I have, I've just let some people in and now it won't let me. Hmm. So let me try stopping the sharing yeah, and go problem. back to it. I'm sorry, it's just a clumsy. That's okay. If I remember correctly, the next slide is a bit of an introduction to uh, immigration and resettlement in Canada. So Canada has a long history of uh, resettling refugees from all over the world. And um, those numbers, yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna take a step back, I jumped ahead. So background just on kind of the global perspective, um, the most recent statistics from the UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, estimates that at mid 2022, um, that global force displacement has reached about 100 million people. So there's 100 million people right now around the world um, that have been forced from their homes due to a variety of, of reasons. When we look at the breakdown of, of those numbers, about 53 million are internally displaced people. So that means they're still residing, still living in their country of origin. Uh, you have to cross a border into another country in order to claim refugee status. So these are individuals that are just in their country, um, not able to kind of live in their homes where they were previously, probably have uh, lack of access to food, appropriate shelter, water, medical care, uh, protection from government. About 32 million people are refugees. So these are individuals that have had to flee their home and who have crossed a border and registered with the UNHCR as a refugee, uh, which is a person in need of protection. And then 5 million people are asylum seekers. And so those are individuals who are likely internally displaced, have likely crossed a border, um, but have yet to, to make a claim or been approved as a refugee. When we look at all those numbers, so we look at 100 million people, 41% of those are children under the age of 18 years, which, you know, is, is about 40 million children and youth. Every year, uh, over the last about five years, there's been an average of about 350 to 400,000 children born into um, the refugee life. So their parents have had to flee and are, you know, either residing in a refugee camp or in a host country, and they've been born into um, that lifestyle. Previous to my role um, at Aurora, I worked at an agency that supported uh, refugee children and youth, and we had many youth who um, 
you know, because of different conflicts around the world, were born into refugee camps and lived there for eight to 10 years. Um, and, and that's all that they knew, um, you know, before, before resettling in Canada. Right now, 72% uh, of refugees out of those 32 million originate from just five countries. So Syria, we know there's been ongoing conflict there for a long time, Venezuela, the Ukraine, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. Um, Canadian immigration trends. So Canada has a long history of resettling refugees. Uh, almost 220,000 new refugees were admitted into Canada as permanent residents between 2016 and 2021. When uh, someone is determined to be a refugee and they're resettled in uh, to Canada, they get the second they land, they get what's called permanent resident status, and they uh, are permanent residents until they apply for citizenship. Some people stay permanent residents forever. Um, some people will apply for citizenship once it's possible, which is about, I believe, five years. Um, but there's a really big cost. Uh, to apply to be a Canadian citizen. So um, that, that's a barrier for some people. We can see that, oh, go back one second. We can see that um, where refugees come from uh, changes depending on what's going on in the world. So in the 80s, uh, we were seeing lots of individuals resettle in Canada from Vietnam, Poland, El Salvador, in the 90s, it was Sri Lanka, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, sorry, I can never pronounce that word, and Iran. Uh, in the 2000s, which is when I entered the settlement sector, we are seeing lots of people from Colombia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. For some reason, there's a gap in statistics between 2010 and 2016, but over the last five years, um, we've seen uh, the majority of refugees coming from Syria, which made up almost 30%. And we know that the government committed to bringing a large number of Syrian refugees over in 2015, 2016. Um, Iraq, Eritrea, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. In addition to um, the number of refugees that Canada brings over, there were also 85,000 immigrants who are recognized as protected persons and were granted permanent residence. So these are usually individuals who come here either uh, or under another immigration category. So it could be international student, could be a refugee claimant who have come to Canada and then made a claim for refugee status and then had that claim approved. So there's lots and lots of individuals arriving in Canada um, who, have, who have lived uh, that kind of the refugee experience. So what does that mean for Manitoba? Uh, Manitoba is steadily increasing the number of people that they are welcoming in as immigrants, uh, which brought in almost 165,000 kind of over the last 12 years. In Manitoba, the majority of people entering our province are coming through the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program. So that's for people who for lack of a better word, are kind of choosing to come to Canada. They put an application in. Um, generally, you have family or a network here already. Sponsored family is 4%. So those are people who are sponsoring a family who have already come to Canada. And then about 12% of the newcomers that come to Manitoba uh, are refugees or protected persons. So it's not a huge, huge number, but we are seeing these numbers grow. And the federal government actually just last week or two weeks ago announced kind of their levels or their goals for the next five years. And they're working towards bringing in about 500,000 newcomers to Canada each year over the next five years. So uh, immigration is uh, alive and well. And I think they just released some information from the 2021 census that basically said one in four Canadians uh, come from kind of an immigrant uh, background. So uh, we can see that, that this is something that's growing in our country. Uh, main source countries of resettled refugees in Manitoba over the last couple of years has been uh, Eritrea, Syria, Somalia, 
the Democratic Repo Republic of Congo, and Ethiopia. Over the last two years, which hasn't really been captured in any research data just yet, we've seen an increase in refugees from Afghanistan and then obviously the Ukraine. Um, I did say here kind of resettled refugees from the Ukraine. That's not necessarily correct. Most individuals who are arriving from the Ukraine over the last six months are actually coming as temporary residents. So they're being given temporary resident status, which is different than um, refugee status. And uh, I think with the with possibly the intention or the goal of, you know, if things improve in the Ukraine, being able to go back home. Uh, my guess, though, is lots of, of those individuals will choose to stay once you kind of move in and resettle and establish in a new place. Um, for a lot of them, they may choose to stay. So just to, to show you here uh, in Manitoba, you know, we definitely see uh, Winnipeg is the, the main destination for a lot of people. It's obviously the biggest city. It's going to have the most services and supports. Um, but we are seeing uh, immigration increase, immigration trends increase in rural areas. So bigger kind of <laughs> small centers like Brandon, Nipawa, Morden, Thompson are seeing an increase, especially with the uh, building of, you know, more industry around those areas. There's more jobs. And so people are, are moving to those areas. So that was just a tiny little kind of snapshot of immigration, you know, in Canada, in Manitoba, and just provides a little bit of background in terms of why this topic is so important. Um, we know that there's lots of people resettling in Canada as refugees, and it's important to note that not every person coming to Canada as a refugee has had the same experience. Um, there's a lot of diversity in terms of people's stories and journeys. Um, however, there, there are some kind of trends. Um, establishing and maintaining a, a secure attachment is difficult in times of trauma. And that's probably an understatement. Um, you know, when there's trauma, when there's war, when there's conflict, um, there's an overall lack of safety and security in the family system. And we know for attachment, safety and security is, is the number one important thing. Often uh, uh, trauma associated with kind of pre-migration experiences, the actual migration experience. So did, was it controlled? Did they get to choose when they left? Did they get to bring stuff with them? How long did they spend in a refugee camp or being resettled? And then the stress of actually resettling and having to adapt to a new culture um, creates a lot of different challenges, a lot of physical and mental health challenges on resettled refugees. The Canadian Centre for Victims of Torture, CCVT, they're located in Toronto. They do a lot of really great work, um, uh, uh, training and professional development around working uh, from a trauma-informed perspective with refugees and people who have experienced trauma. So they're worth checking out. Um, I don't know if they coined this, but I, I found it in their literature. And so they, they talk about what's known as the triple trauma paradigm. So the idea that when someone has been identified as a refugee, um, that they're, they're actually experiencing kind of three separate traumatic events. So we're looking at pre-flight, the actual journey or flight, and then post-flight. So before we go to the, the next slide, um, I've got lots of different uh, uh, examples here. I'm curious, and you can either put it in the chat or unmute and, and shout it out, but I'm curious just if you can take a minute and think about uh, what are some experiences associated with immigration and settlement that might create challenges for secure attachment within family systems? I would think parents being terrified themselves. 
Yeah. Yeah. Loss of extended family, that just fear, right, Joanne, of just everything is scary. There's so much uncertainty. Yeah, generational differences in level of language learning, cultural adaptation. Uh, in, in my work with, with children and youth um, from a refugee background, kids often learn language way quicker. Their brains are, are better and faster than us older folk. And that can really create a huge shift in a family system. It can shift the, the power as, as kids are often um, required to interpret for their parents. At language barriers, um, knowledge, shame, and knowledge about the new culture, knowledge about just all the different systems. Um, I'm curious, Jen, and I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't have to, you don't want to, but I'm, I'm curious if uh, you wanted to just e expand a little bit on your, your comment on shame there. And if you don't, that's okay. I'll give you a second. And if it doesn't feel okay, I'll keep going. Okay. Trust issues is definitely a huge one. Trusting the government, right? The government of, of Canada after your own government has maybe not kept you safe. Parental stress is huge. Parent focused on immediate basic needs, safety, distracted from the child. Um, Oh, I just saw your comment, Jen. I haven't been, uh, yeah, a lot goes to fear. All the social determinants of health, right? We know education, housing, basic needs, uh, employment, how they're treated by the, by the country or the community that they're resettling in. So issues around racism, discrimination, them feeling insecure themselves and a lack of confidence in a new culture. That's great. Thank you so much, everybody. You you basically finished my presentation for me so I can go on. I'm just kidding. Joanne, I don't know if you can zoom in um, just a little bit to make it a little bit bigger because I know this slide does have small print on it. Um, so this is this is the triple trauma paradigm. It's I captured the um, oh perfect. I captured it from the Canadian or the Center for Victims of Torture. They actually have a a ebook called Healing the Hurt, which is a really great resource in um, supporting individuals from a refugee background who have experienced trauma. Uh, but this is, is what they talk about. And a lot of what you shared was just on this list already. So pre-flight, it's harassment, intimidation, threats, really that just fear underlying fear about their safety and the safety of their family, fear of, you know, being arrested, fear of captivity, fear of being separated from each other. There's high levels of loss and uncertainty as jobs might change, housing might change, loss of possessions, um, sometimes lots of relocation needed as a family to keep yourself safe. Um, lack of, like I said, kind of government services. So medical care, basic needs, some of those larger systems. Um, and obviously, depending on what's going on, there, there can be a real, not just fear of, but there can be violence, either witnessing violence um, or experiencing violence themselves. Once a family kind of makes a decision or is forced to flee and leave their home because of all of these different things, they're in kind of what we call the flight stage. And so this is where they've kind of left their own home and they're on the move to somewhere that's potentially safer. As I said, in order to uh, be considered a refugee, you do have to cross a border um, and that's gonna look different for a lot of people. As I said before, sometimes people are able to do that quite controlled. Um, we saw, you know, what was happening just as an example in Afghanistan earlier this year, you know, pictures um, on the TV of just thousands of people um, at the airport trying to get on a plane. We saw with what's happening in the Ukraine, trains being organized, but we also saw that some people were able to get into their car and drive and leave. So, 
everyone's experience is a little bit different, but really this, there's so much uncertainty at this level as well around fear of being caught, sometimes um, having to hide or kind of go underground. Um, in my work, I've, I've heard of people saying, you know, we climbed up the mountain and hid in caves and didn't have food, or we lived in the forest for many days, uh, you know, and, and tried not to get caught. So this time can be very, very scary, can really affect a family's security and access to basic needs. There can be bigger pieces around, you know, uh, not having food and water and all of the, what obviously that does to her overall sense of security. Again, witnessing violence, experiencing violence. Uh, if people do end up in a refugee camp, um, you know, that is, is maybe better than living in a forest without resources, but there's a lot of challenges that exist in there as well. A lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of violence, and um, like I said earlier, like sometimes families have to live there for eight, 10, 12, forever. Um, because in order to leave, you have to be resettled somewhere. And so you have to kind of be um, chosen kind of by a, a host country to be um, brought over. The third piece is the post-flight. So some of you mentioned um, things like racism, uh, total lack of just uncertainty and unknownness of being in a new culture. How do I take the bus? Where do I grocery shop? You know, how do, how do I even line up to take the bus? It, it's, it's everything is so uncertain. And so if parents feel very uncertain or unsure of what's going on. We're going to see that impacted in the parent-child relationship. There's also huge, you know, loss of identity, loss of roles. Maybe you were a doctor or a professor, you know, pre coming to Canada, and now you can't get a job at all. And that's going to change, you know, how you feel often about yourself, your worth, um, even though that's obviously nothing to do uh, your fault. Um, as humans, at least in, in our culture, I think we often put a lot of em emphasis on what we do. And we tie that often with our worth. And so that can be um, a huge change for a lot of families. For a lot of families, even though they're here, they still kind of have one foot back home. So talking to people back home, not knowing where some of their family members are, hearing lots of bad news, um, dealing with racism and discrimination and just being treated really poorly here, uh, inadequate housing, not having basic needs met. There's just so many different pieces that even once someone's here and we think, oh, they're in Canada now, they're safe. There's so many pieces that still impact kind of the overall uh, safety and security of the family. You can go to the next slide. So when we look at uh, how does this impact then, you know, children, parents, families, when we look at attachment, there's some really great uh, literature out there that that talks about this. Um, and one of the articles I read said that uh, intergenerational war trauma has greatly impacted child development and mental health because parental war trauma manifests into the parent-child relationship and then directly impacts that child's attachment uh, style or attachment to their parent. I want to just point out before I talk about this, that a lot of this, the pieces where it impacts does kind of fall to the parent. Um, and I just, I think this is obvious, but I wanna just say it so that it's it's out there. This is not, we're not placing the fault uh, on the parent. We're not saying the parent didn't do a, a good enough job. The parent should have done more. Um, the parent should have been more supportive. These are obviously, um, times where everyone was doing everything they could possible to survive. These are just um, unfortunate realities of, uh, or for families that are living or coming from more affected areas. So some of these things uh, you shared when I asked you to, to say, but number one, like hypervigilance for one's own safety and the safety of loved ones. So that is your focus. You are thinking all the time about 
physical safety. Where are they? Are they okay? Um, is my family okay? It's like that is what a lot of their energy is going to, and they're not necessarily thinking about other things that are, are going on in, in that parent-child relationship. We sometimes see kind of a compromised ability um, for parents to parent or be emotionally available for their children due to either their own distress or distraction with their current reality. Again, thinking about you know, what am I, what are my kids going to eat? Where are we going to be tonight? Um, in even once they've arrived in Canada, you know, worrying about finances or all the different things that they need to do. Uh, extreme parental preoccupation and protecting and finding substance for their family. So again, focusing on those basic needs, you know, in Canada, do I have warm clothes for my kids? Um, can I get them to school? Do we have enough food? Are we gonna be able to pay rent? Uh, really those kind of practical pieces are focused on uh, and not necessarily being available emotionally. Parents are often unequipped to offer their child emotional support to address the current reality. And that's not because they don't have the skills or they don't want to, but I don't think any human ever is, is prepared to deal with war and conflict and knows exactly in those moments how to meet their child's needs when they themselves are, are um, ex experiencing such a level of insecurity. You know, when there's bombs falling or you're fleeing and it's like, let's take a moment, child, and talk about your emotional needs right now. It's not appropriate or it's not safe. And, and what do you even say as a parent in that moment? We can also see high levels of loss and separation within family systems. So sometimes there's actually physical separation. Families are separated. Um, they don't know where parents or children are. Um, so we see that kind of sometimes emotional unavailability if they're together, but there is that actual separation. And I don't know if anybody saw the news story last week. There was a young boy who um, was just brought to Canada and reunited with two of his sisters. He was, I don't know his exact age, he was probably 10 to 14 years old. And he had been separated from his family for years. And his sisters really advocated to bring him here and they don't know where any of the rest of their family is. So when you look at, I mean, how's that gonna uh, impact attachment? It's gonna have huge implications if a child is separated from their parents during those kind of key developmental years, um, but then also adding on that fear and worry of, of, are they okay? Am I gonna ever see them again? And then for kids, there's often a decreased opportunity for them to participate in key developmental opportunities that help them grow, help them develop their self, have those experiences um, away from their parent and the experience of coming back. So these might be things like school, uh, just even being outside and, and playing in the street with their friends. Um, when we look at the circle of security, right, there's that going out and coming back in that helps create that safe attachment. And so if kids don't get the opportunities to ever go out, then they don't have the opportunity to come back. So what does this mean then um, for, for attachment? I talked a little bit about some of the challenges that you know, coming from a war affected area or immigrating and resettling to a new country can have that maybe uh, contribute to insecure attachment between parent and, and child. But what that really looks like when we look at the attachment framework and obviously I brought it back to the circle because everything goes back to the circle. Um, when we look at this, I was making this list and I was basically like, just put one point that says everything, but I, I wanted to put a little bit of detail. When we break it down and we really look at the, the caregiver attending to the child's needs, the, the ability to be a secure base from which their kids go out of. When parents themselves don't have insecurity, they have high levels of stress, 
they're dealing with their own stuff, they, they can't necessarily be that secure base, which means the kids don't necessarily have that base to go out into the world from. It also can relate in a lot of miscues for kids who want to go out and play and explore, but that does not feel safe for their family, um, for their parents, even though they might be here now in Winnipeg and there's a park right across the street from their house, um, their trauma history and what they've experienced um, creates a high level of, of feelings of being unsafe. In order for a caregiver to attend to a child's need, they need to be able to recognize a child's need and where they are on the circle. And we know that trauma can impact how we see things, how we experience others, how we interpret behavior. And so it can really impact um, parents' abilities to be like, is my child on the top or the bottom of the circle? What might be their need in this moment? We can also see challenges in being with. Being with our kids uh, requires us to have some emotional regulation, to be able to pause everything that's going on and really just sit there and be with our kids. If we're worrying about a million other pieces and what we need to be doing to keep our family safe and how we're gonna manage to work two jobs and go to English class and somehow manage to get our kids to school, it's not that they don't want to be with, it just doesn't sometimes I'm sure even occur to them because they're just trying to deal with all these other pieces. Uh, challenges with taking charge. Um, challenges with taking charge. And so sometimes um, we see parents really moving from, and when we look at the, the balance, like moving to kind, their kids have been through so much um, and they just wanna give their kids anything they can. They wanna just help them be happy. It's hard to take charge uh, because on the other side, the kid's behavior might be so disruptive that it's just like, I'm gonna do whatever I need to do to just make this go away in this moment. Um, on the other side, sometimes it's hard to follow the child's need because the parent's so used to having to control every second of that kid's life in order to keep them safe. Uh, I spoke a little bit, but losing the balance or losing the wisdom of staying in balance. And so flipping, you know, from mean to kind and gone. Um, and that's the next thing here is kind of being gone. So being there physically, but taking their hands off the circle because of their own trauma, because of their preoccupation with um, the family's safety and security and, and basic needs. Shark music is obviously a huge one. Um, you know, in, in working with uh, children and youth who have experienced war and conflict and have had to immigrate and resettle, you know, circle of security tells us that all behaviors communication and and often some of these kids ha have some pretty intense ways of communicating their needs or communicating that their needs are not being met. And again, this is not we're not blaming them. We're not saying that they're um, not listening or being respectful. They're doing the best they can as well. But, but that behavior, I think, can trigger parents quite a bit when they're dealing with all these other things. Um, and if a parent has been really distracted or emotionally unavailable because of all the things we talked about before, then likely that child has, has had to learn that they have had to get really, really big and loud in order for their parent to, to kind of be like, oh yes, you are here, how can I help you? And so, uh, that creates a lot of shark music in, in uh, parents. Miscues I talked a little bit about, but again, um, it's not safe. And so limiting, you know, their, their children going out on talk to support their exploration. And then also difficulties with uh, that closeness and the, the welcoming my coming into you. Um, trust and vulnerability may not feel safe for people who have experienced trauma. And so again, kids learn, oh, 
that makes you uncomfortable. And so they miss cue that they don't necessarily need their parents in those moments. And then um, we don't get that full kind of secure base, safe haven circle. Frequent ruptures. So again, if the parents taking their hands off the circle, uh, tending to their, their own needs or other things that are going on in the family system, that's going to create a rupture. And that can happen over and over and over again because of the trauma and just the competing responsibilities of, of, a, of a parent, especially, you know, a parent that might be here as a single parent that's got eight kids. Um, there's going to be some ruptures there. Uh, the other thing is is pushing the child to feel okay. So again, you know, welcoming my coming to you, but I'm going to welcome you and push you right back up to the top because I don't necessarily have the emotional capacity or availability or time to sit and be with, which is, you know, is what we kind of talked about. And then again, which can happen sometimes is just the, the limited delight in me. Um, kids who have experienced a lot of trauma uh, like I said, will uh, communicate their needs sometimes in really, I kind of say like spiky ways, like they're coming in on the bottom of the circle and they're like on fire and like all spiky and you're kind of like, okay, I'll welcome my coming to you. Um, and it can be hard in those moments to delight in in their kids. Um, and on the top of the circle, if you're if you're just so focused on all the other things that need to get done, you may not have time to enjoy with your kid or delight in their kid. And those pieces we know are so important. I just see that there's a couple comments here. To that after. Um, can you go back to the presentation there, please, Joanna? I think I have one more slide on there that I want to talk a little bit about and then we'll open up for some um, questions. And uh, maybe just while this is loading right now, um, anything that's coming to people's minds or thoughts or that they're having as they kind of look at that slide there with all the different ways that this can kind of impact the, the circle and that parent-child attachment. People kind of looking at maybe some of the families they've worked with and are going, oh yes, interesting. Um, this kind of explains some things. Yeah, I could share some thoughts. Um, so I work at a small college, so I'm looking at this mainly in terms of international students, mm -hmm. just thinking about like, yeah, obviously, like you say, it's diverse, but I think a lot of them do fit the context of having at least trauma on at least one of those three areas of maybe, you know, this is often the first coming to Canada is the first big, mm -hmm. you know, separation from family, first big thing on their own. And that can be filled with a lot of, you know, a lot of the challenges when they get here, like you said, the weather, the institutions, racism, safety, finances, and they're doing it on their own. And for lots of reasons, I think the parents aren't always able to, like the parents are often consumed by fear about the parent, the children, and maybe calling every day and the, you know, the kid, but the kids don't, kids, you know, young adults often don't yeah. feel safe to actually share with their parents because the parents are already so worried. I don't want to tell them what this happened or I'm doing bad in my classes and they're just going to worry more. Um, but I was wondering if like, I've, I'm, you know, as I've been in this role, sorry, I'm just like making my lunch and my time is going off. There we go. Um, I've been trying to understand more of like the sort of the role of the in institution in attachment, mm -hmm. because I kind of get that, that like, you know, the, there's sort of like this cumulative of like all the interactions you have with say your school your or your you know college mm -hmm. sort of creates this sense of belonging or not or safety or not and this sort of is sort of is almost an attachment relationship <laughs> with itself, but I'm still kind of new to that paradigm and I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. like okay how do like what does that mean how do we work with that like I, I understand generally like okay it's important to try to mm -hmm. pay psychological attention to the students and you know, be aware of the impacts, but I'm, I don't know, I'm still, it's, I'm just still trying to understand that all, I guess. 
Yeah, um, one of the programs that I oversee at Aurora is a newcomer mental health program specifically designed to I do refer with... there sometimes, yeah. Yes, uh, we get awesome. lots of referrals for international students because yes. they're, they're not eligible so for a lot of other I was going to say, that's such a hard thing is like, it's such an underrepresented, sorry, I'll just, my tiny rant is it's just such an underrepresented in terms of newcomer services being available when they are, you know, sometimes they've come here by choice and with privilege, but sometimes it really is like they're almost on the verge of where they would be, you know, if not refugees, you know, certainly for sort of forced to migrate for economic and, you know, other reasons, you know, and out of really, really difficult circumstances. So they're, that sim they're, many fit the similar profile of refugees and they've come alone without their families. Yeah. And yet, like, they have the most limited access to resources. We really appreciate yeah. your program. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, and, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, in order to uh, register or apply to be a refugee, you have to cross a border. And so, you know, one of the things that we see, you know, if you're an, in, uh, uh, an LGBTQ plus individual who lives in a country where that's illegal and it, there's serious harm to your life, what are you gonna cross a border into the country beside you that also has that same belief? No. Um, and so often people will apply to be international students because it's a safer, quicker way to get out of their country somewhere safe and then they can claim refugee status here if they choose. So just to answer your question, I'm mindful of time. Like, so what do we do? How do we provide support? And, and I think, um, you know, again, I was so fortunate to land at, at New Directions parenting center it was called at the time and, and be introduced to um you know attachment and circle of security because it's something that I as as a program director as a therapist in my role now I just fully incorporate into as much of the work as we do um, that is possible so kind of number one there, there's uh, multiple layers for it so when I used to work at a youth serving agency that supported refugee students we actually ran trainings for all of our staff that interacted with the youth on circle of security so the idea is you know we're not aiming to replace their parent and guardian and their attachment figure but recognizing that they may not have anybody right now that's a secure base or a safe haven. And it provided a really clear model for the staff to be able to view some of the behavior that we were seeing from some of the students and be able to, to be the hands and provide start providing some more secure attachment. The second piece that you know we aim to do, and this is what kind of we do it at uh, part of my role now, is also teaching the parents the circle of security. So the idea is helping them uh, break down into very clear language what some of their children's needs are, how they can meet those needs. And so you have the kid kind of ideally in that circle with their caregiver in you know, and then when they come to program, they've got another kind of safe attachment figure, safe person who can support them. When we're looking at, you know, working with parents, um, you know, I put the pictures of the hands here and I realized I forgot to put the little copyright. So I, this is from the circle of security. Hopefully they don't come for me. Um, but what's really important, I think, is as practitioners, as therapists, as whatever role you are in, is thinking about being the hands um, for those caretakers who also are struggling with a sense of security and depending on where they're coming from they may have had that intergenerational experience with conflict and so never got a secure attachment with their own caregiver so focusing on you know that there's that one handout in that shows kind of the hands that hold the hands and so being that secure base for your clients or for your families or for your caregivers and helping them, you know, using what the circle tells us around helping them go out into the world. What are their needs when they go out? What are their needs when they come back home or come back in? Sorry. Um, I know as a therapist, I often think that, that that's my role for a lot of the clients that I work with is being the hands, supporting them to go out and take risks and learn and try new things. 
and then welcoming them back in when things are difficult or those risks didn't work out. So I think, you know, uh, Mel, your question is how do we support is looking at the circle of security model um, and, you know, being that secure base for a lot of the students being that battery charger, uh, you know, we talk about them coming back in and filling their cup and, just that connection is so important. And if none of their families here, lots of international students are cut off from their family for lots of different reasons, then we can be that battery charger. We can be that cup filler. We can support them um, and, and kind of help them as they go in and out, right? So they go out into the world and they try to do their classes and it doesn't work. So they come back in and we, help them organize their feelings about what's going on and delighting in them and all those different pieces that we would do, you know, that caregivers would do. The circle often I think focuses on younger kids, but we know that everyone across the lifespan has attachment needs and can benefit from having a secure base and, and a safe haven. What I'll say uh, just as my maybe final piece, because I know I want to leave some time for questions is, when we're looking at supporting caregivers, so being the hands or the hands, um, we may want to teach them circle of security, but likely there'll need to be a lot more counseling therapy work done on uh, individually on a couple issues. So number one, um, things like shark music. So if you've experienced a lot of trauma, there may be things that really trigger you and it's not necessarily from your own childhood or, you know, oh, my kid's being disrespectful. It's like pretty significant trauma. And we know trauma, you know, changes our brain um, physiologically. And so you, you likely have to do some one-on-one -on -one work that accompanies and helps the parent process that and support them through that. Same with being with right? If a parent has difficulty uh, regulating their own emotions, then of course they're going to have a difficult time doing that with their kid. So there may be additional support or therapy required to help the parent learn their own emotional regulation um, kind of in tandem of, of helping their kids. So I always kind of go back to the circle. I, I work from kind of an attachment narrative perspective um, and I think the circle still has a lot, a lot of value in supporting families who have experienced um, this triple trauma paradigm. And uh, Mel mentioned, you're right, there are a lot of similarities in what I'm talking about with people who just come to a new country, because that, that last column, the post-flight, a lot of that still applies. And so, um, yeah, that, that's kind of how I, I use the model. And we've got the base kind of circle and the eight session group that we do. And if you accompany that with sometimes some additional counseling or therapy or support and really help the parents with those spots that they're struggling with, um, you, can, you can see some really positive change. Uh, one last thing I'll say is I was trying to find some research on this. Um, when I was doing the presentation and some of the stuff I found kind of talked about how uh, a secure attachments, you know, going into, let's say, experiencing war or conflict and immigration and resettlement can become insecure because of all those different things we talked about. They also can provide a lot of resilience for people. Um, but there is a whole notion about post-traumatic growth. We talk a lot about PTSD, but I think it's important to note that there is this whole concept of post-traumatic growth. We know the brain has the ability to learn and change. And so through, I think, a lot of different support and through providing that base for our, our clients that we're supporting, um, we can really see people thrive um, and and kind of those those parents being able to re- back and meet the needs of their kids. And then we can see that how that that positively impacts the kids. That's it. I, I'm happy. I was worried that I wasn't going to have enough, which is always my worry. And then I always end up talking so much, I almost run out of time. But um, 
any questions, comments? Uh, yeah, anything anybody wants to chat? I think we've got a couple minutes here, Joanne, before we finish up. Yeah, for sure. And feel free to unmute yourself and just speak if you are comfortable. Before we, we end up, maybe I'll get Joanne, you can stick the last slide up again, okay, not sorry. necessarily right now, but at the end. So um, my contact information is there. Um, as I said, I work at Aurora Family Therapy Center. We have a uh, program specifically designed to support newcomers, regardless of their immigration category and regardless of how long they've been in Canada, um, who have experienced kind of moderate to severe trauma and, and are, are struggling because of that. We also have a, a kind of a general family therapy program that provides support to, to any Manitobans who um, may benefit from uh, counseling or therapy. So my contact information is there. If you have any questions or um, want to reach out, you're more than welcome to. Hey, can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay, I missed a little bit at the beginning. Maybe you mentioned that. Um, like we can uh, understand that we can refer families to you, to your center. Yeah. All right. And are services for fee for a fee, or or there is some coverage, or? So our family therapy program, which is kind of open to any Manitoban, does have a fee. Uh, it's sliding scale, so it ranges from five dollars to 78 dollars a session it's based on household income um and so that is quite uh, uh quite more accessible let's say than the private sector uh our newcomer program mental health programs are funded by the province and so there is no fee for service it's all free well, what uh, is free? sorry what is free for service Fee for service, it just means there is a cost. Yeah, but free, you said there is a cost, but then you said uh, that free, uh, something is funded and I missed that. For newcomers. Oh, yeah, for newcomers in our newcomer mental health program, that program is completely free. There's no cost for uh, people accessing it. And we have partnerships with MATC. And so we can work with children and youth. We've got a psychiatrist, we've got a psychologist, we've got lots of, uh, wraparound supports and we also have um, all of our clinicians are, are newcomers themselves and I think between them all we they speak about 12 different languages if uh, we get a referral for someone that doesn't speak one of those languages we have access to uh, interpreters so people can participate in therapy in, in whatever language they'd like. That is very good uh, do you have some uh, therapist uh, speaking Ukrainian or Russian? You know what, we don't, um, but it's something that we're we're looking into just because we are seeing an increase in need for service. Uh, clinic with a K is doing some really good work in supporting some of the new Ukrainian arrivals. So I would potentially check with them because they may have a, a Ukrainian speaking or Russian speaking therapist. How does it work with, um, you know, like just to give you a little bit of background, that more than in Winkler areas, and you could see, and I could also see it supported by your bar graph, more than is number for largest co community with um, newcomers, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, the transportation is a, a huge issue for them. Yeah. So what are the options in, for that? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, obviously the global pandemic has created I mean, so many different challenges. I like to say the tiny, tiny, like right. small silver lining is that um, a lot of services that were traditionally thought of as needing to be in person, uh, we saw that that they can be provided virtual and they can be successfully provided virtual. So our newcomer program is available to any Manitoban. So for those people living outside of Winnipeg, they would just participate in, in virtual or Zoom therapy if they weren't able to uh, come into um, the agency. 
Heather, yeah, just as we wrap up, I know there's yeah. a question on the side about oh. um, <clears throat> permission to use some of the slides that you used. Um, how do you feel about people? Um, I mean, I know you're, you've given credit to Circle Security for the work that, that you shared, but. Uh, yeah, I think that everything in there um, has been sourced correctly, but I will double check. I think that this presentation, Joanne, if I'm correct, is is recorded and will be posted. Yes. Um, yeah, we're so going to post the presentation probably by next week. It'll be up um, in our podcast column on our uh, website on attachmentnetwork.ca. Yeah. So I think for now, you know, possibly if, if people are interested in using the information, they can look at the webinar and, and kind of grab it from there. And, and um, yeah, I think that's probably best for now, but I'll have a look at the presentation and, and look at, you know, whether or not it might be worth sending out. Uh, the Circle of Security graphics, I just grabbed from obviously their website, um, just to kind of connect it back to uh, the Circle. Yeah, and if anybody's unfamiliar with Circle Security, uh, their website is uh, circlesecurityinternational.org. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the training is uh, very intense. I was like, I went to bed, I think at 6 p.m. every night I took it because my brain was just so maxed out in information. But I think that um, it really changed uh, how I view things and how I work with everybody whether they're kids families adults individuals I think it's just so beneficial and I tell everyone I told you I drank the Kool-Aid so I tell everyone you know if you can if you can do it um do it because it, it's just so beneficial and creates a really uh clear kind of just blueprint or framework for for attachment needs and we all have attachment needs so it's just so relevant well I'm going to pop up your your um contact information one more time mm -hmm. here for people to see please do and um and and i want to thank you heather for giving your time so generously to us today i know there's a lot of work that went into preparing all of this and gathering data and making slides and everything mm -hmm. um as i said to to remind everybody in about a week if you if you have colleagues that missed this or you want to share the presentation it should be up on our podcast series i also want to mention that we have developed a series of podcasts that are being dropped yeah. monthly in this month this week the toddler one um, is being dropped and that's some conversations that laurie mcpherson has with dr simon malik a local child psychologist mm -hmm. and they're based on the brochure series that we did of 10 things your child needs you to know um, so look for those and those are starting to get a little traction they've been downloaded uh, into a few different countries now so it's exciting mm -hmm. um, to see that and, and maybe I'll end with um, a quote from the Circle of Security training that they attribute to the Talmud. I've never actually looked it up to see if that's true or not, but um, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. And I think I was sort of sifting through uh, that thought as you were talking, Heather, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the folks who are, <laughs> who are just trying to stay safe and just trying to stay alive and, and get somewhere where they can live the way they had hoped they would live. Um, you know, come in when they land here, come in with perspectives that um, that are so different than, than what we, mm -hmm. those of us that have grown up and not in a harmful place um, can hardly appreciate. And so always in, in our attachment work, our work is to step into the shoes of another and try and feel what they feel and, and, and live that um, experience through them uh, and honor what it is that they've um, lived through. So, Thanks so much for bringing that to our attention today. And thank you everyone for, for coming and having lunch with us. And hopefully we'll see you in the new year when we resume our lunch and learns again. Thank you for having me. And thank you to the Attachment Network because I believe that this is all volunteer run and uh, it's really important and the work you're doing is great. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody.